I was talking to a friend who works at Target, who wouldn't share certain store policies with me because she could lose her job. So, Reddit, what are some corporate secrets you can now disclose about, Company X, now that you no longer work there? Former fast food manager here. I don't know if this is a company-wide thing, but our regional mic manager strongly discouraged us from firing anyone who had worked there more than 6 months, since they'd be eligible for unemployment. Instead, we were encouraged to make their lives into a living heck until they, hopefully, gave up and quit. It's practically policy at McDonald's. Source, my McDonald's manager handbook. I worked at a Hilton hotel where I had to stand for 8 hours straight and was given breaks only if the front desk wasn't busy. There always had to be one person at the front desk at all times. Florida law doesn't require breaks, but most companies do. Hilton does not. If you book a hotel room on one of those travel websites, Expedia, Travelocity, etc., you are guaranteed to get the worst rooms available. Sure, if the hotel is completely empty, you'll get a fine room. But if the hotel is half full, you'll be getting the crappy rooms because you paid the lowest price. None of those websites can guarantee room type or accommodations and I've pee people off many times because we didn't have the type of room they thought they booked. Also shady stuff happens in hotels. Employees have quickies in vacant rooms. Employees sleep in vacant rooms without telling housekeeping so they don't get in trouble. And it never gets cleaned. Pro tip. Be extra sweet and nice to the front desk people. They don't get paid enough to hear people bitching at them for other employees mistakes. Also, it'll get you special treatment if you're having a problem. I know this isn't that juicy but I used to work at an overnight camp. I had also gone there as a camper. And every morning we had a drawing where we put all the campers names into a hat and picked one out at random. And the kid that got picked got to spin the wheel of wonder and do silly stuff to the counselors like pour flour on them. Or throw water balloons etc. Well as it turns out when I was old enough to be a counselor they let me in on the secret. All the papers inside the hat are blank. They pick a kid that seems to be having a hard time adjusting to camp life. Or a kid who isn't very social and then pretend to pull their name out of the hat. In conclusion, my childhood was a lie. I used to sit there every morning hoping and hoping that they would pull my name but I never won. At least the kids that really needed it end up getting that extra attention though. I used to work at Starbucks. We were always hyper vigilant for people who ordered a tall mocha and continually checked their phone. Starbucks secret shoppers always order a tall mocha and evaluate us based on time, quality of the drink and whether or not we were pleasant and friendly. These secret shoppers would get us employee rewards if we did a good job. If you want a dang stinking good cup of chocolate flavored coffee with hilariously over the top customer service, you know what to do. I used to secret shop Starbucks, I always used to get a tall white chocolate mocha, twist. Payways chicken lettuce wraps? The chicken is the fatty bits we cut off during morning prep work. Whoever carves the chicken all day just gets a little sloppy so that the pieces he cuts off are 80% fat and 20% meat. Then it all gets minced in a meat grinder. It's one of their top sellers and it costs the company next to nothing. Since the alternative is throwing away the fatty pieces. Former meat cutter here. We did that with just about everything. We called it the rock pile. We'd package it up and sell it for super cheap. It's great for making soup out of. I used to work at a Disney store. If you ever hear them mention a customer as a customer and not a guest it means they are suspected of shoplifting or something else bad. I worked at American Apparel for 2 years. During the time that I worked there, the company implemented a company wide recruitment policy where any person applying for a position must be photographed. One headshot, one body shot, the actual resumes were thrown in the garbage. These photos were then sent to a company email address where someone would either give a thumbs up or down to the photographs. Staff were encouraged to recruit in store and on the street and were given a $100 bonus for every person they got approved. Before this was implemented, all existing staff were photographed again, one headshot and one body shot. Anyone deemed to be physically unworthy was let go from the company. Of course this wasn't legal. However right before they started this process every employee had to sign a waiver form. 
that was pretty much a lot of legal gibberish. On the spot, I wanted to have a lawyer take a look at the form however I was told I had to sign it on the spot or I would be let go. There was also a company intranet website which all employees were to check on a regular basis. This was Dove's main line of communication to all staff. The site would have pictures of girls from the stores where he would rip them apart for having too thin eyebrows, for having ugly makeup or bad tattoos and piercings. They were basically publicly shamed for not looking the way he wanted to. He would also post memos saying things like hire more Asians. Needless to say, I no longer work for the company and will never shop there again. I've actually wanted to get this out there cause it has really bothered me and it's been a few years. I worked at Dollar Tree. Terrible decision BTW. The store had a charity drive for toys during Christmas. We would ask people at the end of their checkout if they wanted to donate a toy for active military families kids. The incentive for the cashier was to sell the most and you would win like $100 or something. I got second place so I don't remember. Anyway, we sold what had to be thousands. So we thought, it was easy since what's one extra dollar right? Well, whenever the customers bought a toy it went into a big bin at the front. However, after every day, this bin was unloaded and was recycled to be sold yet again, over and over. In other words there were only so many toys that they just sold over and over. I guess they figured that we sold so many, that every local kid would buried in toys but I will never forget it. It makes me sad and reluctant to donate unless I know it'll actually go somewhere. This wasn't the only thing that was sketchy either. I used to work at Petco. They had this spa upgrade added to their grooming package. Included special scented shampoo, conditioner, and teeth brushing. By corporate, each store had to sell a certain number of spa packages to meet the quota or they'd be written up. The manager at my store added it onto every dog, even if THD customer didn't ask for it. Suddenly a dog whose haircut should cost $50 now cost $70. We had many complaints and lost a log of customers. I used to work for Toys R Us and majority of the rare toys that people try to collect usually don't even hit the shelves because the workers already put them aside for themselves. My brother stocked shelves at Walmart for a couple months, and the night guy who worked the Hot Wheels section would call people up whenever he was stocking and they would sort through for all the rare ones before they even hit the shelves. Used to work at Round Table Pizza. Don't order anything that requires an ingredient that seems completely random. Like the shrimp, that sits out in the open until it runs out and we have to change it, which is usually after 2-3 days. I worked at a Pepsi factory at the beginning of summer. Concentrated MTN. Dew will burn through your freaking clothes. The oven roasted chicken at Subway is boiled in the microwave. I worked at a pet store once. It was probably the worst job I had. Animals were generally well taken care of in our store but almost never touched or played with, unless the managers were gone. This pretty much makes any animal we sold pretty hostile to its new owner or unmanageable. It also sucked because when stupid kids would come in and want to hold animals, we all would groan on the inside, knowing we were probably gonna get bit. The kid was definitely gonna get bitten too. Probably will also drop it in surprise and make us run around trying to catch it again. If the management had let us handle them a bit more we wouldn't have had kids freaking out over being bitten by a gerbil or a parakeet or people bringing the animal back when it wasn't instantly warm and receptive. AMR, America's largest private ambulance company. Contracts with counties will specify response times that they need to meet to remain in compliance. Typical response windows are about 10 minutes in heavily populated areas and 14 minutes or more in more rural areas. This compliance usually needs to be maintained to 90% or higher for all 9. 1. 1 calls generated. Several times this year we've been too good and been running compliance up at 98-99% for the month. AMR's response is to cut staffing hours to save labor diesel costs. They are willing to be late at the end of a month because they know they'll still hit their monthly compliance requirement. I personally think that's despicable. Even though most 9, 1, 1 calls are BS and not a medical emergency. Somebody that needs a defibrillator right now could have a reduced chance at survival in the name of pleasing corporate and ultimately the shareholders. I worked for an ambulance company in La that was basically made up of former AMR employees who were pee off at their bulls. Once we had our schedule, we were set. Plenty of overtime. They treated us really well. 
AMR is too huge to give a crap about people. It's like the Walmart of M's. Was at Coles for 5 years. Supervisor for 3. Not sure if these are all true of all Coles, but definitely were at mine. We were encouraged to sign everyone up for a credit card. Despite age, language barriers, etc. I absolutely hated signing people up for those cards. Especially only because they wanted to see if they could get a discount. I would give them the discount regardless if they were approved or not. If I didn't sign enough people up, I would get warnings. The APR on them was 27%. The jewelry cases were all opened with one key and pretty flimsy even then. With a hard jerk, you could easily open them. Also, a lot of the diamonds that were under 1 stroke 4 carat were fake. If you were returning something without a receipt and were getting a corporate refund, that meant that you were, 95% of the time, returning stolen merchandise. We would tell them they'd get a check in the mail. The other 5% were if it was extremely old merchandise, like, 3 plus years old. A few people got the hint, those that didn't were in for a sore surprise when they would never get a check. You could easily let a friend know your associate number, go to Kohl's, say you work at a different store, give the number, and get the associate discount, 15%. If it was returned and wasn't noticeably damaged, it went right back out on the floor, no matter how long the person had it. Inventory was always off, probably by about plus minus 5 units per item. I'm sure there's tons more I can think of, but it's been a while. Ex Kohl's slave here, you pretty much got it all. People will do anything to get the stupid Coles cash. I saw a customer get $400 worth of stuff, divided it between 3 credit cards and talked about how she got free money referring to her Coles cash. Jimmy John's has a secret ingredient in their tuna. It's Kikoman soy sauce. Nothing shady, just thought you'd ought to know. It's common for restaurants to fill Heinz ketchup bottles up with off-brand ketchup once the bottles are empty. Off-brand ketchup haters, beware. We used to do this with Coors Light, Bud Light and Miller Light. If we were out of one we'd just switch it. Only one dude ever called us on it and he was wearing a Nazca hat and maintained a beautifully coiffed attack mullet. Former office depot technician reporting in. You bring your computer in for a $100 virus cleanup. We hook it up to the network and let some guy overseas fix it. Most of the tech employees know about as much about computers as the average 45 year old shopper. I used to work at Home Depot. They had at the time. Can't confirm if this is still true. As this was 2004. A policy that if a model of power tool was out of stock. The next level up in quality of that tool and that brand would be sold to the customer for the price of the out of stock tool. At Whole Foods, all that fresh baked in-house bread actually comes par-baked and frozen. You can buy the frozen loaves if you ask a team member behind the counter. A lot of the items out on the floor display in the bakery are also frozen and put out in the evenings to thaw before the next day. Six Flags theme parks have a problem with gangs. Management knows about this and will alter certain operations to deter crime on designated gang days. Elaborate. I worked for 2 years for LEGO, and have nothing but nice things to say about them. For the most part, everyone I encountered there was awesome. I used to work at the Imca as a lifeguard, and we had a security camera at the indoor pool. Multiple co-workers were fired because they were caught texting on the job on that camera. I became good friends with the boss, and he ended up telling me about how our security camera was useless because the lens was constantly fogged up so the footage showed nothing but blurry figures. He had instead fired my co-workers based off rumors of texting or if he didn't like them. My buddy is a Imca lifeguard, says that you clean more poop up than you would expect. I'm not doubting him. I worked as a bouncer in a nightclub called Piers in Indiana. It was a huge nightclub broken up into 5 sections. Sports bar, karaoke bar, pop music, hip hop music, and the main room, which is where concerts rock music played. Well, they like to keep the blacks corralled into the hip hop bar or sports bar and out of the pop music bar, so that the white people didn't get scared. If we as bouncers noticed there were a lot of black people in the pop music area, we would give the DJ a thumbs up, and he would turn the music to techno until the black people left. Don't wanna scare them white folks. I'm white. Ruth's Chris Steakhouse here, home of expensive crap. 
All our soups are brought in, in a frozen bag. We would just just throw the bag into the steamer in a perforated pan until it thawed. Then keep it warm until someone wanted a bowl. We would just dump frozen chunks of pre-cut lobster into the bowl on the line. The heat of the soup would thaw them out. Don't remember how much it was. More than it was worth. I worked at a Lowe's home improvement for a few months after college. Everything in the seasonal department has a huge profit margin. And as soon as it's slightly out of season the price will drop and haggling becomes available. More time elapsed since next season stuff got in equals more haggling off the sticker price. The outdoor furniture sold during the summer is crazy overpriced. Wait until they start to roll out the fall selection. Your choices will be more limited, but my managers used to give away $200 tables for $50 or less because they just wanted the floor space back for new stuff. This is even more true for decorations, like Halloween inflatables, Christmas lights and fake trees. Same thing goes for the seasonal power equipment. Deals can be acquired on leftover snowblowers, depending on who you're talking to. Also, Lowe's almost always puts power equipment on sale right when they get it, usually 15-25%. For example, snowblower sale in October. Beware, this may not work as well on expensive, low stock items such as a log splitter. Pro tip, when buying something big, like a mower or an appliance, ask the salesman if the manager can get you a better deal. When this happened to me, my manager would check the margin on that item and give them 10-15% off right on the spot. This happened almost every time someone asked. Till haggling is still a thing for some corporations. Yahtzee. For all you ladies, Estee Lauder owns Mac, and ever since they purchased Mac, they have been using Mac formulas across the board for their cosmetics. This would be awesome if they hadn't immediately altered and watered down the Mac formulas upon purchasing the company. Also, Sally Girl, the Sally Beauty brand of makeup. Yes it looks super cheap and comes in small quantities, but it is all formulas of much more expensive brands. Especially the nail polish. Mac equals studio gear of Ulta. And they are made in the same production facility. Some days they put it in Mac bottles. Other days it is packaged as studio gear. Want to know the secret of finding a high quality makeup brand? See if they offer makeup artist pro discounts for free with credentials. Mac charges makeup artists for a discount. I worked at a foreclosure law firm that was basically a mill. We represented banks in the foreclosure process and took people's homes. I gained employment at the firm through a temp agency, and if you made it past 90 days, you'd become a permanent employee. My first day, I noticed that the entire firm was mostly women in their early 20s, and no one was saying a word to each other. I soon realized that this was due to a high turnover rate. Everyone was new and rarely made it past the 90 day mark. I made it a year and a half and could go on forever about the banking industry and why we're in the mess we're in. Because the foreclosure process in most states is judicial, it goes through the courts and sometimes takes years to get to the foreclosure sale. We would have to create affidavits for each case that had a breakdown of what the defendant owed to the bank. We then emailed thousands of affidavits to several banks where people would sign, date, notarize and FedEx back to us. This sometimes took weeks for the banks to send the affidavits back and we'd have to cancel a ton of court dates, which resulted in us having to re-request more affidavits, thus delaying the process even further. Because these documents have to be filed prior to the court date, we'd have to cancel the hearing if we didn't receive and file the affidavit 25 days in advance. The management would tell us to switch out signature pages from old affidavits so we wouldn't have to wait forever to get new ones from the banks. I hated that place so much and I saw so many people get fricked over. Towards the end, I started to shred paperwork from the bank that contained ridiculous, exorbitant fees charged to people that were already hard up in life. Did you know that if your home is in foreclosure you are charged an inspection fee of about $10 a day where someone from the bank just drives past your house to make sure it's not vacant? It's bulls. So I started making those bulls charges disappear by way of paper shredder. I would delay some foreclosures because there's no reason why a bank needs to take the house of an 80 year old woman dying of cancer that only owes 10k on her home but can't pay because because of her fixed income and oh yeah the cancer i feel like a bad human being for working there frick that place and all the places like it i work at red lobster one the biscuits are 130 calories each 
2. None of the food is homemade, it's all pre-packaged and frozen. 3. Every type of pasta is just microwaved, actually a lot of the food is microwaved. 4. You can buy the chocolate lava cookie or the apple crostada at Kroger for $1. Former casino employee here, avoid slot machines near the exits and cashiers. They are designed to pay out poorly. Pro tip, avoid casinos. Those security cameras? Nope, not real. This is really pretty common. Except Target. That crap is very real and the best money can buy. Rue 21 policy will not let them stop shoplifters. Even if the alarms go off at the front, have to let them go. You can't even accuse them if you witness the act. This includes management. They really only care about stopping employee theft. Yeah, I had a friend that worked at Abercrombie, and he said that if they saw someone stealing something, that they were supposed to suggest something else to go with it. This belt would look awesome with that pair of pants, bro. What are some secrets about widely used products? The samples of cleaning products are much more potent than the stuff you buy. My dad's company makes the spray bottles they use. They send samples to test the sprayers because the over-the-counter versions are more watered down. If you send them an email saying you like their products they will often send you samples in the mail. The strawberries and peaches in Quaker Instant Oatmeal are actually flavored dehydrated apples. The blueberries are flavored dried figs. Gorilla Glass was developed in the 60s and no one had any idea what to do with it until we actually started using smartphones that need it. They're selling it to us as a cutting edge product, but really it's 50 years old. The key ingredient in Pepto-Bismol is bismuth, a metal 86% the density of lead, hence the weight of a bottle of the stuff. Bismuth is used because it is toxic to some bacteria that cause diarrhea, along with some other nifty characteristics, but a genius science teacher I had in junior high told me the weight of the bismuth allows it to displace stomach contents very effectively and reach the source of your problems. Bismuth also makes your poop black, good to know ahead of time. Trader Joe's generic Cheerios is made by General Mills. They are Cheerios. Most generic foods are second line goods from the same manufacturers who make the branded goods. Pet food labels. If the product's label statement is a single listed, unmodified ingredient, turkey, pork, chicken, etc., it has to contain at least 70% of that ingredient. If it uses a modifying word, chicken entree, salmon dinner, Beef stew, etc. That percentage declines to 10% for wet food and 25% for dry food. If the modifying word used is with, with beef, with chicken, etc. It declines to 3%. Your stapler has two different settings. One to keep your papers more or less permanently bound together. And one to keep them loosely attached if they need to be separated again. To activate the loose setting. Push and rotate the little metal plate on the bottom of the stapler. I had wondered what that splaying plate was for. Duraflame logs were created in 1968 as a byproduct of California Cedar Products, whose main business was producing wood slats for pencils. They were looking at a way of reusing the sawdust from making 4 million pencils a day. They hit upon the idea of combining paraffin and the sawdust and extruded the mix to make the product we all know and love. If you have a high efficiency clothes washing machine and strictly use tidy detergent and cold water, your washing machine will quickly grow stinking, rash inducing fungus. That's why PNG invented a special tidy cold water formula, but they never told anyone what they knew. So most people are still using the regular tide. Solution, if this is you, buy the tide cold water, an occasional bottle of a different brand, or occasionally run a hot water load. You can avoid this entirely by leaving the door open after you empty a load. You have to let the washer air out dry out to prevent mold and fungus from growing. Hydrogen peroxide will clean blood stains out of just about any fabric in a matter of minutes. Pretty much take care of the color for you too. I don't think this is really a secret but men's razors are usually a lot cheaper than women's and way better. I feel like more women should take advantage of this. Yeah but the handle doesn't smell like raspberries, and as a strong independent woman, that's important to me. Nearly all wasabi consumed in America is actually horseradish, food coloring, and additives. 
Actual wasabi is rare and difficult to grow in most environments. Jokes on them. I love horseradish. Head on is a homeopathic remedy, meaning it's nothing but wax, no active ingredients. If you pay attention to the commercials, you'll notice that they never claim the product does anything. I always thought it was weird that Sunny D listed canola oil as an ingredient. Something is very off-putting about it. Most every processed drink has some kind of vegetable or canola oil to make it go down smoother. Insure is basically milk protein, a multivitamin and canola oil. The reason baby onesies of the unique fold over oval type opening for the head is because it is very stretchy and easily goes over the baby's entire body. Meaning, when the baby poops so much it goes out the diaper and up their back. Instead of pulling the onishi up and over their head and spreading the poop in their hair, you pull the onishi down scraping the poop off their back and taking off the onishi over the diaper. Dang, I have read this 19 years too late. Ford Motor Co. in the early 1920s produced a lot of lumber scraps and waste at their factories. So much, they decided to burn it and resell it as charcoal. This is now kings for charcoal. Armor All, ex-car detailer here. This was the absolute worst product in car detailing existence. It does nothing except make your dash slimmy, prone to getting very dirty very quickly and, under heat and sunlight, can cause the dash to crack. We hated armor all especially because it was a nightmare to remove completely. So yeah, your car dash looks glossy for a bit, or slimmy, whatever. It's also crap. Using those cheap latex gloves you can buy just about anywhere are a cheap and incredibly effective way of pulling out pet hair. You simply put on the glove and rub your gloved hand in circles over whatever surfaces, couch, carpet, pillows, that haven't wanted pet hair. It pulls it up in a convenient to throw away ball. It's a million times better than using a vacuum. I have an Aussie that sheds like a maniac and I break out when there's too much pet hair floating about. This has seriously done wonders for me. Foolproof way to clean up pet hair. 1. Put on as much black clothing you can. 2. Get ready to go to something important. Interview. Concert. Etc. 3. Walk around your house and avoid all furniture. This will pick up an inordinate amount of pet hair. Play-Doh was originally sold as wallpaper cleaner in the 1930s until classrooms started using it as modeling clay and it eventually became rebranded as a toy in 1950s. For your information, the reason why people needed to clean wallpaper was because back then most homes were heated through coal chimneys. The black coal dust would accumulate on the wallpaper. You only need one Alka-Seltzer. In the 60s a marketing director told the company producing Alka-Seltzer that he could double their sales. He did this with the now iconic phrase plop plop fizz fizz in a jingle. Till that time they had only recommended a dose of one. And this jingle was about rebranding it as a pack of two. They did in fact nearly double in market size very shortly after releasing this jingle, mostly attributable to people now taking two at a time. It marks the beginning of larger serving sizes to increase sales. There's a guy in their board meetings biding his time to propose his revolutionary idea of plop 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 fizz 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 fizz. Toothpaste commercials convince you to use way more toothpaste than you need. I like my mouth to be bubbly and foamy like a rabid dog. Aureus are actually a knockoff of another cookie called Hydrox. One of the few cases where the knockoff was more popular than the original. Well yeah, Hydrox sounds like a toilet cleaner. The Hitachi magic wand is sold as a personal massager, that's kind of right. WD-40 kills wasps, cinnamon deters ants, and soapy water kills ants. You can use vinegar in place of jet dry in the dishwasher, works just as well for pennies on the dollar. Food products that specifically advertise high antioxidants are essentially beasting people out of their money. There's natural antioxidants in almost every semi-healthy food and advertisers know that people will buy it because it sounds healthy. To add to yours, the label all natural is BS and meaningless, legally and logically. Legally the term all natural isn't recognized by the FDA so anything can be all natural. Logically, anything can be all natural because we are in nature. Also, all natural doesn't equal good for you. For example, arsenic, lead, and hydrochloric acid are all natural. Duck hunt for the NES. If you plugged in a controller into the player 2 slot, you controlled the duck. 
You are not telling the truth. Please tell me this is a joke. Dove and Axe are owned by the same company, Unilever. One promotes female self-confidence by redefining beauty while the other advertises itself using highly sexualized images of females. They also own Ben and Jerry's ice cream which promotes highly unsexualized bellies. I work for a major major beauty company but all the other employees and I swear by coconut oil. It's the holy grail product. Moisturizing dry legs, arms, and elbows. Using as a shaving cream. Prevents ingrown hairs as well. Mosquito bite it reliever. Heavenly. Cooling sensation. Sweet henna for coffee. Extra natural energy as well. Lip moisturizer chapstick. Great for overnight. Helps stretch marks during pregnancy. Great eye makeup remover. Natural lubricant for intercourse. Please do not use with condoms as oil breaks it down. Contains antibacterial properties so it's great to apply on a cut, rash, or burn. Mosquito repellent when mixed with tea tree oil. Rub small amount on arms and neck before hiking, being outdoors. Cooking agent for stir fry, pancakes, and more. I get a jar of organic and virgin coconut oil from Trader Joe's. 16 ounce jar for $5.99. And it lasts me more than a month. A little definitely goes a long way. Most over-the-counter sleeping medication, sleep as, Zquil ETC, is just repackaged Benadryl which is an allergy medication. Diphenhydromine HCL is the active ingredient in Benadryl and just so happens to make you sleepy as frick. Some people more than others, also you can build up a resistance. So don't buy the overpriced 20 pack of sleeping pills for the equivalent cost of a 50 pack of non-brand name Benadryl. You're just throwing money away. Most soap is not actually soap. In order for something to qualify as soap, there must be a certain percentage of ingredients, most notably of vegetable glycerin, which is a byproduct of the soap making process. Since vegetable glycerin is super great for your skin, most mainstream soap companies will actually separate the glycerin and sell it at a higher rate, for things like lotion, conditioner, and even vapor liquid now. Then they replace it with chemicals and detergents which essentially do the same thing but way worse. I think the FDA has actually passed some regulation on what can be called soap, which is why certain companies will refer to their products as beauty bar, cleansing bar, etc. Dove has even tried to market beauty bars as being better than boring old soap, but don't buy it they are just trying to cover up the fact that they are using inferior ingredients. Peanut butter gets gum out of your hair. Nutella is the filling of a Ferrero Rocher. I may be the only one who finds this extremely interesting, but it's about how t-shirts are made. So, ever notice how most of your t-shirts don't have side seams? That's because the body of the shirt is knitted as a tube in the round. This is the fastest way to produce knit fabrics. Because no stops are necessary, the machine keeps rotating while the fabric is pulled down. There are 1-2000 needles all working at once, and if you have 30-50 packages of yarn attached to the machine, you're knitting 30-50 rows every time the machine rotates. Imagine that each new row is staggered slightly behind the row below, which it does multiple times a minute. Now you know why t-shirts are so cheap, but the machine size is fixed. You can't make the circle larger or smaller. So do they have different sizes of machines to correlate with different sizes of t-shirts? Nope. That would be a waste of money for the company because the machines themselves are so expensive. So instead, they alter the tightness of the yarn being threaded into the machine. If the yarn is tighter, the tube of fabric will constrict when it exists the machine, resulting in a smaller tube, small sizes. If the yarn is loose, the fabric will not constrict so much, resulting in a larger tube, large sizes. This means that small size shirts are more tightly knit, and have a higher cover. Kind related to thickness how much can you see through the fabric, while larger sizes are looser and have less cover. Fabric cover doesn't translate directly into product quality, there's many other factors, but it is considered. You don't want a see through shirt, and that's the dirty secret behind your t-shirts. Smaller sizes equals slightly better quality. Clothes, pillows, and blankets sold by large retailers are usually saturated with formaldehyde or a similar chemical when manufactured and shipped. This is done to deter insects from eating the cloth, mildew, and provides a more pressed look. Prolonged or repeated exposure can irritate the skin it contacts, 
Wash cloth items you buy or let them air out if you are unable to wash. Also a chemical that manufacturers spray on pine, wreaths, Christmas trees, garlands, before shipping to keep them preserved and add to the natural aroma can cause all sorts of irritation simply by breathing it. After shaving, run your razor forward against a towel about 20 times. It will hone the razor and make it like new. I'm going on 10 months with the same razor. Before that, I had a year on a disposable razor. It works and it saves you a ton of money. When pouring oil into your car, pour with the spout on top, as opposed to next to the hole. It is easier to control and less spills. People who work for airlines, what are secrets passengers don't know? When flying overseas there are generally no systems tracking the movement of your aircraft for several thousand miles that is, how they go missing. People fake needing a wheelchair to gain boarding priority. 10 wheelchairs get on and only one person needs a getting off. We call them miracle flights. If you checked your dog there's about a 30% chance it's terrified before it even gets on the plane. Who knows how scared it gets during the actual flight. Bag room agents will usually try to comfort a scared animal. But all we can really do is talk to it, so if you write your pet's name on their carrier it usually helps a lot. I've never seen a cat who was scared in the bag room. Cats don't give a frick. That there's a huge list of things that can be missing from the aircraft while still being allowed to fly. True. It's called a minimum equipment list, Mel. Counterintuitively, it's a list of what can be broken on the aircraft while it still remains airworthy. It should be noted that the operational limits of the aircraft are altered to respond to broken parts. For instance, if certain lights are broken, the aircraft is restricted to daytime use. You know how all the other armrests can be raised except for the one next to the aisle? Turns out that one can be raised as well via a small button in a divot on the underside of the armrest. Useful if you want to spread out a bit more, though some flight attendants may tell you to put it back in place. If you check a skateboard by just slapping a sticker on it, it will get ridden or used as a dolly. I might check my skateboard just to entertain the baggage dudes. Paramedic here. If you switch on your alarm lights on the ambulance while being on the inner field of the airport, because, well you just get there sometimes, they will totally shut down all incoming and outgoing flights until they know exactly what's going on. My buddy learned this the hard way, needless to say people got mad at him. I'm an outstation mechanic for multiple airlines. I cover all flights at a major US city airport, by myself. Where to start? If your flight has a maintenance delay and there is no on-station mechanics for that carrier I get called. If it's a quick fix, I fix it. If not we check to see if it can be deferred to get fixed later. Either way, most of your delay is spent waiting on me to do all the paperwork to clear the aircraft or for me to finish the other 7 calls I'm out on to get to your plane. There is also constant pressure on both me and the pilots to clear fly aircraft that have some fairly significant problems. I have airlines try to get me to sell some pretty sketchy stuff to the pilots to get them to fly and avoid a costly delay. I have no problems telling a pilot to call his controller's dispatchers and tell them to frick off if I'm not comfortable with whatever concoction of deferral action I was asked to perform. Don't get me wrong, the airlines would never willingly fly an unsafe aircraft. But if there is say an engine vibration that is just right at a sea hair under the limit they will fly it. If the oil is super low but servicing it will cause a delay, service it at the next stop. If the pilot encounters something at altitude that I can't duplicate on the ground, sign it off and see if it happens again. Those are the ones I usually push back on depending what it is. Also, if you have to get out of your seat so a mechanic can fix something don't be about it. I get harassed all the time by passengers even though my sole purpose is to get them in the air. Besides, I tell gate agents all the time not to load packs until I get out there but they never listen so go be at them. Not a secret, just common sense. The reason some bags miss their flight or get misrouted is because passengers don't remove old tags. It confuses handlers as well as the conveyor belt scanners. I see it happen all the time. I used to work for warehouse that supplied a certain airline with items. The headsets that are given to you are not new. Despite being wrapped up, they are taken off the flight, cleaned, and then packaged again. Flight attendants have a list of who is who and what seat they are in. 
as well as what level of frequent flyer they happen to be, or if they are employees or family and friends tickets. This is why you will see them being rude to someone or bending over backwards for jerks. Flights are routinely overbooked because there's an estimate per route of what percentage of people tend to miss the flight. So if you don't have a seat assignment, you might not get on. Which is why they ask for volunteers. If you are a frequent flyer and know the busy times and flights you could volunteer all day from every flight going to a hub and make $1000 in credit. Invest in quality luggage. You are the only one that handles your bag with care. Your bag is going to take a beating in the system. Employees and their families get it tickets it is for industry discount, which means they only pay taxes and fees and nothing for the actual ticket. The airlines basically lets them fly for free, and not just with their own airline, but with every airline in any alliance. The tickets are standby tickets, so you're not guaranteed to get on board, but you get a seat more often than not. The family members can travel on these tickets without the employee. My dad worked for an airline in Star Alliance. So I used to get free tickets with airlines in One World and Sky Team as well as Star Alliance. I usually traveled in business class, all around the world. A return trip between Europe and Japan was something like 200 US dollars in business class, and maybe 50 US dollars in economy. I don't get any perks anymore, as it was only valid until I turned 25. Sometimes your pilot can be on food stamps because they only make 19k Baggage handlers see hundreds of bags a day. No bag is treated special, unless it is obvious. Even then, depending on the person, sometimes they are not, which is rare. Bags are not intentionally harmed. They are, however, intentionally thrown, slid, jostled, stacked under hundreds of pounds of other bags and exposed to the elements because that is the nature of the job. You can safely assume that your bag is touched and handled by at least 7-8 people per flight segment. If you are connecting at least 10 different people, not including TSA, sometimes the vehicle that fills the potable water for washing hands and making coffee is parked next to the vehicle that is used to dump the shitters and fill the blue juice for the labs. They're not supposed to. Sometimes, they are parked at a distance from each other, which is policy, yet the guy who is filling the water is using gloves that he hasn't changed in over 2 years. The most power you could probably wield is Twitter. The employee in front of you has so little power to actually remedy tough situations. Baggage handlers are usually short staffed, as well. Customer service agents are usually limited in their options. Also, it would help us get a message to higher ups because our work is not being supported as it should be. Heck, I'd even recommend asking an employee about the problem and say something like, if I were to take my complaint to Twitter, how could I phrase it in a way that would help you too? You get more customer protections buying directly from the airline. All those third party travel sites are owned by the same company, and you'll lose a lot of the right afforded to you in the airline's contract of carriage. If you're nice to people, they'll be nice back to you. When the drink card is coming through, you can ask for a full can of pop instead of the tiny little cup filled with mostly ice. Not particularly a secret but one time I was upgraded to business class on a plane that was delayed for maintenance. Just settling into my middle row I'll seat up at the movie screen bulkhead when a hatch in the floor of the cabin right at my feet flipped open and the maintenance engineer climbed up. He had a clipboard of paperwork for the pilot to sign, then climbed back into his hole, tipping his hat to the passengers before closing the hatch over his head. If you look for it you can see a recessed pull ring in the cabin floor in front of the first row seats behind cockpit. I work revenue management for an airline. On average, the cheapest time to buy a ticket is Tuesday afternoon. The cheapest time to fly is Tuesday, Wednesday, or Saturday. This applies to US flights in my experience. Aerospace fastener production here. Nobody there asks what is actually holding the plane together. Don't worry about it. The coffee is absolutely disgusting because no one washes the container that goes out every morning. The station agents who get paid way too little don't give a crap about cleaning it. I certainly didn't when I worked for AA. Also, because we weren't given the proper supplies to clean it, we pretty much just rinsed it out and dumped coffee into it. Be nice to the ticket agent and they will pretty much always let you get away with overweight bags. If you were funny, I'd even not charge you for bags. 
my partner worked for Delta for about 4 years as one of the guys who loads and unloads your luggage and waves wands. Nothing is safe in those bags. They pop open all the time and your crap just gets haphazardly shoved back in. They get tossed around like volleyballs. Tsa is a lie. A lot of decisions about boarding or switching flights, act, are at employees discretion. Worked on military aircraft but it's something I've noticed pretty universal about jet engines in general. You have your auxiliary engine that runs while the aircraft is parked, providing power, hydraulics, AC, ETC while you're at the terminal. When getting ready to depart, you turn on your main engines. It takes a lot of power to get them started. As such, most of the auxiliary power goes to starting the engines. This is the point where usually you may see the lights flicker, and you will hear the whine of the main engine start up. The environmental control unit, or whatever they want to call it, stops cycling air during this start sequence. Without fail, if you watch for it, numerous hands will stick up and check or adjust the air conditioning vents as this happens. The air will kick back on when the engines are up and running. As shown in some movies like Executive Decision and Passenger 57, there is a secret hatch on every plane that allows people to travel freely throughout the aircraft. Also, Wade Boggs once drank 50 beers on a cross-country flight and then absolutely destroyed the Seattle Mariners the next day. Worked at multiple airports as a consultant and this is common at almost all I've worked at. Mechanics love to take their coffee breaks right behind the security checkpoint. This is where you will see women in a rush with their outermost garments off and bending over to put their shoes back on. The jackpots are passengers that didn't know a sweater or hoodie they are wearing had to come off until they are told to remove it by the tsar. So they have very little underneath. I wasn't part of this so don't downvote me. Just telling the tales of the trade. Not an airport. I worked at a theme park in Florida. There was a water ride where ladies would often get their blouses splashed with water. There was a bridge over a part of the ride where you could look straight down as the riders went by. It was a very popular place for male employees to stop and look over the rail of the bridge for a few minutes. People who work in fast food, what is one item from your menu you would never order? When I worked at 7-11 years ago one of the things we got was a nachos machine, which had a big glass bin full of chips and two heated cookers with spigots on the bottom. One for chili and one for cheese. It was pretty popular. I don't know if there was supposed to be some cleaning schedule, but we never had one. Cleaning it meant emptying the cookers, which wasted food, the boss said. In any case, the cheese one wasn't so bad. When it was low we just dumped in another tub of cheese. Some oily separation, but it seemed okay. The chili, on the other hand, tended to mold, which crept up the insides of the cooker. When it got low we'd scoop the mold off the top and wipe the inside a bit, then just dump another batch of new chili in on top of the old. If I weren't young and stupid about things then I'd probably have said something, but all I did was avoid the stuff myself. The cheese and chili come in bags now and a pinch tubes pout. No food actually touches the machine anymore. Probably cause of you cheap boss and cheap bosses everywhere. I didn't work there but I went to a subway once and got a fountain drink with my sub. I thought I saw something tiny drop into my cup when I was pouring some sprite but didn't pay it much mind and put the lid on. Later on, when I had almost finished drinking it, I remembered the thing I thought I'd seen. Took the lid off, and behold, many tiny ants. I was hanging out with a bunch of people I didn't really know during this. I just put the lid back on and stared at the wall in silence. This reminds me of when I ate an entire bowl of cereal, and a spider crawled out of the milk at the bottom. Not fast food but I worked in a movie theater and found out only two of the inside metal trays of the popcorn machine were cleaned weekly. I took it upon myself to dismantle it and clean the rest of the machine. It was lined in the corners with mold probably dating back to when the machine was originally purchased. Not every machine out there is fully cleaned as places just clean the most used pieces. Dang, we had to clean those be out every night. Closing freaking suck because of those bastards. Burger King made me clean the fryer hoods with a spray bottle and paper towels while the fryers were on and in use. I could hear the degrees a sizzling as it hit the grease. I'm surprised people didn't get sick. Taco Bell was the same way. Someone actually spilled a bottle of that cleaner in our fryer and the manager wouldn't let us change the oil because the cleaner is non-toxic. 
I work at Taco Bell. And there's not one specific item I wouldn't order. I just would never get anything within an hour before closing because it's not going to be as good at all. I worked in a Taco Bell that was open 24 hours. Any food prepared after 2am was made with minimal effort. Worked at Pizza Hut, both delivery and restaurant, and honestly everything is pretty alright. But we are having a North Carolina pizza right now, which is fairly popular and man that pulled pork smells like cat food and that drizzle is the most confusing taste ever. Imagine cane sugar, honey, mustard, cayenne pepper, turmeric and else. 30 grams of sugar slash 100 g, and barbecue base. I work in full service, but this is a good rule of thumb for any place you go to. Don't order it if an ingredient is only used in one or two dishes. That ingredient is going to not be as fresh, because it's not used as often. Along the same lines, don't order a dish that fits a restricted diet if that diet isn't popular in your area. The only exception to this rule is a small menu or what the restaurant is known for. Typically these go together and they are either cheap eats or really expensive. Dunkin Donuts, never get the culatus. The machines at the one I worked were hardly cleaned. Also if you want fresh donuts go to one with a bakery and not one that gets them shipped from other locations. They change them out every 12 hours. I've seen too many moldy ice containers for the soda fountain to ever order a soda. I make do do with what I have at home. Get a 50c canned soda from the vending machine at work. Or get a bottle of water if I'm eating on the run. I've found it's actually a little cheaper most times. The combos meals are cheaper than say a burger and fries and drink separately. But more than just burger and fries. For all of you saying don't get ice, just soda. I have bad news about the cleanliness of the soda nozzles at most fast food places. Don't get any of the Asiago cheese or cinnamon sugar bagels from the Gun Barrel Road Panera Bread in Chattanooga. TN. They may contain skin flakes from the bakery manager's leg. I personally witnessed her pinching the wet dough without gloves, scratch a rash on her leg, and go right back to pinching the bagels. Those varieties start with holes that are pinched closed and toppings are placed in the resulting divot, delicious when done to sop. Also standing water, roaches, and ethical dubiousness. Actually, I'd be shocked if she wasn't fired years ago and it's probably all fine now, but better safe than sorry. This was satisfyingly specific. Subway. Tuna is literal poison in a container. It is always several days older than expiration. I used to walk on shift and throw it out by look alone. Dang I always thought that was the best. It tastes good and I haven't died from it. Yet. I never worked in fast food, but I did work in a grocery store that had one of those quick service food bars that they would empty and sanitize every night after closing. I didn't work in the food department, but in the produce section. One night just after closing, before they had emptied them, I was mopping the floor nearby and a mouse unearthed itself from inside the pasta salad tray, hopped down onto the floor and ran off. So, the pasta salad. That mouse had just absolutely indulged itself. I used to work at Subway and I'll never eat a tuna sandwich. This is like 5 comments about Subway tuna now. Take note, folks. I don't want to read anything negative about Taco Bell's shredded chicken burrito. Do we understand each other? Don't take that from me. Please don't take that from me. The only thing I've seen in here about Taco Bell is no black beans as they sit sometimes and develop a film and jalapenos. It seems so long as it's a newer Taco Bell. We're safe. You'll see these comments in BuzzFeed and top 10 YouTube videos soon. Number 14. Burger King Foot Lettuce. I worked at a Chick-fil-A and everything there is usually great quality however I would not recommend getting egg on a salad that is legitimately the grossest egg I've ever eaten. On a more positive note not a lot of people get strips which are in my opinion the best tasting chicken. I freaking love Chick-fil-A. Literally every one I've been to has some of the nicest staff I've ever dealt with at a fast food place been at them all over the country. They actually seem like they're happy to be there. Plus the chicken is hands down the best chicken I've had at any fast food place, ever. Also, they use the tiny ice cubes that don't melt and instantly water down your drink. Don't get lava cakes for delivery. 
They are really great but they are dang near impossible to keep intact in the insulative bags that are used for delivery. They are small and therefore easily crushed by inexperienced drivers and also the sauce melts through the cake because the main dishes, e.g. pizza, are hotter than it. It's freaking molten. Nice to see Taco Bell going strong after looking at all these comments. Work at a Taco Bell. Plenty I wish you wouldn't order, but quality wise nothing I wouldn't order. Only thing that I've ever seen sit a gross amount is black beans. I worked at a popular midwestern pizza chain for a while. The pizza was really good and the ingredients were fresh, with the sauce and dough being made fresh every morning and the veggies delivered whole and sliced and diced by hand, along with whole blocks of mozzarella being shredded throughout the day. Good food, felt good about making it and serving it. Literally the only thing we got that was consistently gross was the lettuce we would use for sandwiches and salads. It would come pre-shredded in a plastic bag that was who knows how old and would turn brown and slimy seemingly within the first hour or two. And I think that's par for the course. When our store opened on Chicago's north side, we took the freaking neighborhood by storm. People instantly became downright addicted to the pizza, but at least once a week people would call in or walk in angry about how disgusting the salad was. Also, seafood. My golden rule is never to eat seafood unless the place actually specializes in seafood. I worked at McDonald's. Don't get breakfast after lunch starts up. It sucks for the employees, but also, if we can, we are just gonna microwave your food. Biscuits, griddles, muffins, folded eggs. It's all gonna get nuked, especially if we are real busy. I also don't recommend bacon. We let it sit out for a good while sometimes. If I'm going to McDonald's I don't really expect anything above microwave level taste anyways. Have worked at 5 guys for 8 years and it's genuinely the cleanest environment you could imagine. Order anything, you're good, including the milkshakes. Machines are cleaned every night and deep cleaned once a week. Same with the freestyles or soda fountains. I also worked at 5 guys and holy crap it's the cleanest restaurant I've ever been in worked in. Straight up neat freaks in every aspect and it's awesome. Everything is so fresh and everything is cleaned daily. Sweet tea. I worked at McDonald's for a couple years and once they ran out of clean bags for the sweet tea so they kept rinsing out the old one but it had so many creases you couldn't really get it clean. They kept using it and using it and stuff started growing in it. Disgusting. Why the heck did I post this? Ignorance is bliss. I love their sweet tea. I work at 5 guys. Literally everything is stupid fresh and clean. But the grilled onions and mushrooms might sit longer than desired. I work at a slower store so this might not even be an issue. It is amazing when a place does this. Can really taste a difference. I love 5 guys. I worked at Starbucks for 4 years. Your food is safe. We had this company called Ecosia, and they went behind the health inspector and did detailed inspections. I couldn't have my nails painted for 4 years. Food was checked a couple of times a day with thermometers, and we would fail if we had a sanitizer rag outside of the bucket, like on a counter. Trust me that place is safe. Dude, Ecosia put the fear of God into my spucks. We never failed but we were always scared to fail. I agree with your assessment, everything there was pretty safe. I have a personal vendetta against animal fries from an N-Out. Not that they're bad or the ingredients aren't fresh but they're such a rip-off you could literally get a cheese fry and ask for a side of spread and grilled onions and put it in yourself for half the price. Animal fries are almost the same price as a double-double like. Anyways thanks for coming to my TED talk. Back when Taco Bell sold limeades, we actually used whole limes and cut them up when we needed them. I kept a case of them in the walk-in cooler. I went to grab some to prep for the day and almost all of them were moldy. I told the manager about it and she told me to cut them anyway. I refused and threw the case out. In other words, any kind of fruit item should be examined thoroughly before consumption. If they ever brought limeades back, I would never drink one. Jimmy John's here. There is a group of sandwiches called Slims that are only meat or meat and cheese that are popular for those with kids and I've tried them all except the Slim 6. The Slim 6 is just two pieces of provolone cheese on bread. It might not be the grossest thing ever but since JJ's doesn't have a way to toast sandwiches, it doesn't sound good to me since it's just two pieces of cold, bland cheese on bread. 
I pass by a gas station that has a fast food franchise called Crispy Crunchy Chicken. I know the answer is to literally not get anything from there, but what the heck is that place? In my opinion, they have some dang good biscuits. They have some kind of honey butter drizzled over them. Arby's already has a bad rep. I actually like it well enough but under no circumstances should you get a beef and cheddar. Make them put a cheddar slice on it like civilized people. I'll just say this. Cleaning out the cheese goop pump when closing was enough to prepare me for working with human stool, sputum, and blood lab specimens without blinking years later. I've told this before. But I worked at a Japanese casual fast food restaurant for a while and we had this thing called a volcano roll. It cost $7.25. A California roll there cost $3.75. The volcano roll was a Cali roll cut into the shape of a triangle and topped with spicy mayo that has been heated up with about $10 worth of fish. Literally just a few bits. You are much better off ordering a Cali roll and paying $50 extra for spicy mayo on the side and asking them to heat it up. I had one guy come in with a girl and he ordered a couple of regular rolls like spicy tuna and yellowtail, along with a volcano roll. When served in the restaurant, unless they ask us, we would put the sauce on top so it looked nice, like a volcano. When I brought that roll over he was like, oh, I didn't know you guys put the sauce on. I've only gotten it for pickup and the sauce is always on the side. I don't really like it, could you bring me one one without it I tried not to laugh and said sure. I went back and the sushi chef asked what was wrong. I told him that he didn't like the sauce and wanted one without it. He laughed and said alright, so he took a cali roll, cut it up, and put it on the plate. I brought it back to the guy and he was super pumped. Basically this guy paid $7.25 for a roll that would have cost him $3.75 and me and the sushi chef got to split a free volcano roll. Normally I would have just told him about it, but the dude was being pretty arrogant the entire time. I'm guessing to act like he was a sushi expert to impress the girl he was with. I actually vaguely remember reading this from before. Been a decade since I worked there but don't get chicken fries at Burger King. My local BK's chicken fries were rock solid and barely anything inside. It was 80% breading that I actually couldn't bite through. I've had great chicken fries before, just not locally. I did the control F to see if anyone claimed to work at Starbucks and say don't order the chicken sausage biscuit. I found nothing. Good, because that crap is fire. Nice try Starbucks marketing team. I work at Culver's. I'd eat and have eaten everything on the menu, nothing about our food prep cleanliness scares me off of anything. Not all the food is low calorie, mind you. Edit. Wow never expected all the love for Culver's. Not a super huge brand but it is 662 restaurants strong, mainly in the heart of the country. One of the best, and most difficult, things about the brand is that they are all individually owned and operated except a few family store remain. So all Culver's and your experience rely on a present and engaged owner operator. Without that, the place may be like some have described, while all core values, outgoing hospitality, fresh made to order food, et, are expected at all stores. Sadly that is not always the case. P.S. No, our burgers are not soaked in butter. I've been to many Culver's, including some in different states. Of all the fast food chains Culver's consistently has the friendliest staff. I wonder what the secret moral source is every time I go in there. Doesn't surprise me they would have top notch operations in the back of the house. Now I want a butter burger. Well I would never order anything from Panda Express anymore because I got sick of all the food. But if they still have mandarin chicken on the menu it's literally just chicken that comes on a bag and gets microwaved for 5 minutes before getting dumped into the serving dish. So that. Not quite a direct answer, but pretty funny. As a young dude, I was part of a crew doing relief work after Katrina. 14 I think at the time. So many donations. So many companies trying to help. One such company was Chiquita Banana. The donated a shipping container worth of bananas. Now keep in mind, where we were 80% of people still have no power. We have an industrial kitchen thrown together literally from plywood, duct tape, and vinyl screen. All set on a cement slab that survived. Maybe three industrial fridges. Day one of a 20-ish day shift. Guys the bananas are rotted. We saved what we can. 
plus 100 heat, no rain since the storm. Can you move the rest to the dumpster? I didn't know what banana death smelt like. I didn't know what yellow death tasted like or felt like. Slimy brown juices coiling their way down my clothes, into my soul. Then every day, every meal, a dish with banana. When I came home, I couldn't eat bananas, or even be around the smell without gagging for two years. I loved banana pudding, and now can eat it again. It's pretty well known how Wendy's chili is made and although I know it's healthy and fine and possibly even tasty, after having to prepare the meat hundreds of times, there is no way it's ever going in my mouth. I worked at McDonald's for 5 years. Never order the milkshakes. The machine often breaks and when it does the milk base stays inside until it is fixed, usually causing to go bad. The machine is kind of cleaned but never as good as it should be. Every time there is a limited time shake, that is, shamrock, or eggnog, the syrup pipes get all gunked up and the only way to fix that is to shove something in the pipe like a broken fork or chopstick to dislodge the gunk. I haven't been able to order a milkshake in the last 5 years because the machines are always broken. You have been visited by the safety doggo. Subscribe and you will be safe from all danger for the next 24 hours. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Or don't. Either way, have a great day you magnificent people.